Thanks, Bob, and, and thanks again for the invitation. And, and first of all, thanks very much to the foundation, particularly who really let us get started with this project in 2017 when we won the, uh, the award here in the Shark Tank competition, and that really got us going. So I just wanna thank the foundation again for that. We couldn't have done it without you. So here's where we're up to. Um, EpiMind is the company that, that we started. And uh, as Bob mentioned, we were involved with a, a seizure prediction study a little over 10 years ago now, where we learn a lot of new things. And, and most importantly, we learned not only that seizures are underreported terribly, but they're also overreported terribly. And it became clear that we're really flying blind in our treatment of epilepsy. So the objective with this device was to have a less invasive system with which we could capture EEG data continuously for the primary purpose of counting seizures accurately. And we'd also learned, and, and this will be elaborated on in a later talk, that we can accurately predict seizures if we can accurately count them. But we need good data, we need continuous data, and we need it streamed out to the cloud so that it can be analysed on the scale that's necessary to realise uh, an opportunity like this to the range of people that it needs to get to. Uh, the device itself you saw in the, uh, the image there initially is based on a cochlear system. So it has a behind ear unit, which contains a battery and a Bluetooth system to transmit data that's extracted from the system to a mobile phone. You can see there, there's the uh, system in place in the first image, the actual system itself. You can see it's got an induction coil off the top through which power and data are supplied and a single strip of electrodes, which has four contact points covering both hemispheres. Um, the behind ear unit you can see there with a magnetic uh, system which couples to the induction coil through the scalp. So that's all exterior, the black uh, device that you can see there in the centre. Streams to the phone. So the mobile phone that you have, it streams data continuously to that and from there to the cloud. And the data that comes off it is in a standard format that can be analysed in many systems, including our own analytics through, uh, through the Minder cloud and, and SEER. And um, we're doing a study at the moment. I'll show you some data from the study, not the results of the study in a moment. And we're doing a study to establish the safety of the device and to show that we can continuously record data of the type that we need. Uh, it's perspective open design. And, uh, and as you can imagine, uh, unlike all of the positive aspects we heard about this morning about uh, clinical trials and the ability to decentralize them and run them remotely, we have the opposite problem with device trials where whilst we can do the monitoring remotely, we can't put the devices in and the obstruction to surgical procedures during the COVID crisis has been a catastrophe for device implanting companies. Um, we're looking to implant up to 30 subjects for our FDA approval and we're utilising up to six sites in Australia at the moment. Uh, the follow-up's up to three years. So we put the first device in nearly three years ago now and we've got about 10 devices in currently. Uh, the device goes in through a seven centimeter incision behind the ear. That's where the, the can sits. Uh, at the moment with the device we have, that you need to make a small furrow in the bone that sits a small pedestal on the base of the system. And then we pull through the electrodes to the scalp on the other side. The procedure takes about 30 to 40 minutes. And some of the data that we've got from the uh, device we've published, again, not the results of the, the, uh, the study that's underway, but I can tell you that the uh, procedure is, uh, is well tolerated. The patients complain of very little discomfort. The scars are all under the hairline and behind the ear. Um, uh, we had no significant complications from any of the devices. And most importantly, the devices can be worn overnight. The cochlear devices for hearing were designed to be used overnight for patients who might want to hear, for instance, children in, uh, in their sleep and so on. So th they are made to be worn overnight. You don't wear it behind the ear necessarily overnight. There's a clip so that you can wear it on a collar which makes that more convenient. So these work, so patients wear them overnight and we have very good adherence and we get great recordings. We've confirmed this by doing ambulatory monitoring. So we do ambulatory uh, video EEG monitoring on the patients at two one-week intervals. We've recently increased to three one-week intervals given the trials extended along the period. And here's some of the data from that. So you can see uh, up in the top panel there, panel A, you can see a, a seizure and um, you can see the uh, standard 1020 set of electrodes running up the top. In blue down the very bottom are the electrodes from the device. And just above that in black are two electrodes from the scalp that we've placed above the electrodes from the device to be a more direct comparison. I've tried just to address some of the questions we often get. Uh, can you see sleep changes? Yes, you can see in the, the bottom left there, we can see uh, sleep changes quite nicely. Do we get EMG artifact? Yes, because uh, distant electrodes on either side are close to temporalis. So you can see their chewing artifact 
in the scalp electrodes overlying in the black and in the blue underneath from our implanted device, but it doesn't obscure the recording. Uh, in, the, in the final one there, you can see on the other, other hand, we don't see blink. So you can see the blink artifact in the scalp electrodes, but not in our bottom two electrodes from the implanted device. We can extract this device and, and have it transmitted out to the cloud where it's analyzed in this sort of manner. So the uh, top panel there shows uh, seizure or event detections, I should say. So these are seven second electroencephalographic events, which have been automatically detected in the data uh, represented there. And you can see the, the blue lines, uh, blue shaded areas represent the periods of video telemetry that we've confirmed seizures. The red triangles at the top are, are seizures that the patients either reported or that we have seen during the monitoring. You can see the pattern of the seizure activity. You can see the relationship of the seizures to the increasing uh, event activity. And from that, uh, you might be familiar with these techniques of extracting from the data, these cycles of seizure activity, which form these complex uh, systems of activity and are very individual for patients, which allow you to relate the occurrence of seizures to a particular phase of their cycle. Uh, in this patient, there's very strong cycles at 18 days and about 29 days. These are quite common sort of cycle durations for patients, but everyone's different. And with this, we can uh, start to generate some predictions. Uh, so here's data, uh, again, from the same patient. Uh, top panel here shows seizure probability uh, estimated from the same data. You can see there's a little blow up of one of the segments of that down below. Uh, you can see there though, that this, these black bars represent the probability of a seizure occurring in the next hour for that patient. And you can see that the clustering of the seizures around the uh, predicted probability high points are very high. Now the, the red and, and orange lines you can see running parallel to the X axis represent cutoff points where we're able to give the patient uh, an estimate of them being seizure free. So their high and low probability uh, cutoff points. In this case, if we set them, these are tailored to the patient. So this gives this patient 80% of their time in guaranteed seizure freedom. So this, as it turned out from the earlier study, was far more valuable to patients than being able to tell them when they were gonna have seizures, was telling them when they were not gonna have seizures. There's lots of other data that I, I won't have time to show you, but we can see the effects of therapy. We can see changes of sleep and stage. It. There's lots of other things we can do with this continuous EEG data. And we hope to be able to return next year with the complete results of our study. Thank you once again for your support and uh, for your uh, attention. <laughs>